Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. MashaAllah, this place is always so full of barakah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to fill it with barakah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a gathering that is surrounded by his malaika upon which his tranquility descends. May Allah make us amongst those that are pleasing to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Miftah. Everyone say ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of the students at Miftah, the staff, the volunteers, the scholars, all of the people that make dua for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite our hearts and make us pleasing to him. Allahumma ameen. So the topic that I chose for tonight, and I'm going to get right into it inshallah ta'ala because I don't have that much time to talk about a pretty important topic. And that is integrity. Integrity. But the integrity of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be very specific. The integrity of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa That quality that he had. And I want you to think about the times that we live in today. And how the Prophet ﷺ talked about a time where trust is lost. Where you can't trust people. You can't trust leadership. You can't trust neighbors. You can't trust family at times. You can't trust all of these people that you should be able to trust. And of course he was speaking to a generation ﷺ that he had raised. Where you had companions sitting amongst each other that had literally guarded each other's backs in war and had been through the khandaq, been through the trench. And the Messenger وسلم, talking about a time that trust becomes so rare once again. And I was thinking about the famous hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu ibn Yaman and he was talking about these signs of the Day of Judgment. He said that there would come a time where trust is lost to an extent that you would hear about a trustworthy person somewhere and you would say inna fi bani fulan rajulan amina that there's in that area a trustworthy person someone that you could deal with i found someone that's trustworthy that i could deal with and it would be as if that's strange to find someone that is trustworthy right to do business with or whatever it may be trust and then i go back to the life of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and there are many qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu to talk about. And I pray that all of you have developed a, a deeper connection to him through this conference. And that it's something that you're developing ta'ala, because that journey of developing a connection with the Prophet Sallallahu is a lifelong journey because you're literally trying to be more like him every day that you exist on this earth. And he was described with many things Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kana wasiman, jameelan, halim. He was always smiling. He was a person who was exceedingly beautiful. He was a person who was exceedingly kind. Kareem, generous, forbearing. All these qualities existed of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prior to Islam, right? Before Islam, he has all these nicknames. But the two nicknames of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that stand out are, can anybody say them? As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. He is truthful. He is trustworthy. And you know what that tells you? The fact that those are the two qualities that stood out. Truthful and trustworthy. Two things. Number one, that those qualities are so rare to find in a society that when someone exhibits them in such an obvious way, that is what gains the admiration of the people. Especially in a time, of course, where you had corruption. Once again, you had class hierarchy. You had tribalism. You had all of these different forms of oppression and transgression. And you had people that would cheat one another, especially the outsiders that came into Mecca. And you had amongst them a man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sadiq, ameen, truthful, trustworthy. When he speaks, he speaks truth. And when you entrust him with something, you know that you can entrust him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So number one is that when people assign those qualities to you, that's because they're rare in society. That's why those become the most prominent qualities. The second thing is that you manifest them in a way that is more beautiful than even those who also possess those qualities. There were other people that were people of sidq and amana, people of truthfulness and people of trustworthiness. But there was only one, as-sadiq al-ameen, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You could trust him. You knew he would speak the truth 
and you knew that you could trust him. And those were the two qualities that made all of the other qualities beautiful, as the ulama mentioned, because if you're not a trustworthy person, then all of the other good qualities and characteristics can actually become vices rather than virtues. Because your kindness is actually conniving. Right? All the good qualities that you exhibit are to take advantage of people, to exploit opportunities. Because amana ties it all together, a trustworthy person. And if you live long enough and you've been burned long enough and, and by enough people, you just say, man, I just want someone I could trust. You start to value friends, you start to value people on the basis of integrity. It stops being highly ideological. It stops being highly tribal. It really becomes, I love that person because I can trust that person. I know that when I'm talking to that person, I know that when I'm dealing with that person, that I'm dealing with someone who's going to hold precious what I share. They're not going to betray what I share with them. I know that I can trust that person with something significant. I can be vulnerable with that person without them exploiting those vulnerabilities. These are qualities that you look for in people as you get older when you realize amana is so rare in every generation. And the more that corruption rises, the less that you find the quality of amana, trustworthiness, being present. Now let's start with the Prophet ﷺ in this moment, as-sadiq al-ameen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he invokes that quality when he stands on a safa. He doesn't invoke his generosity. He doesn't say to the people, have I not been generous with you? He doesn't say to the people, have I ever frowned at you? He doesn't say to the people, have I ever brought you harm? The Prophet ﷺ invokes his trustworthiness. You trust me if I tell you there's an army coming, right? You know I've got your back in this life. Therefore, know that I also have your back in the afterlife. That's why, even though he was, as Imam Shanqiti, rahimullah, says, very beautiful, Muhammad Amin, says that the Prophet, sallallahu Bashir wa nadir, right? He was a giver of glad tidings, and then he was a warner. He didn't, you know, from the uslub of da'wah, from the manners of da'wah, you, you start with the glad tidings before the admonishing and the warning. But when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa stood up on Safa, when you're talking to people who already know who you are, when you're talking to people who don't need you to soften the blow, they trust you, right? He immediately goes to the fact of urgency, like, look, I'm trying to protect you. I'm talking to you this way because I really want to protect you. You know me. You know, uh, if, you, if you walk past a, a gathering and you have, and I don't want to generalize and just say this is like evangelical Christians, but like, you know, at least... Uh, you know, I went to LSU at some point in my life, Louisiana State University. There's literally a corner of LSU where you had the preachers that were sitting there and, and you're going to hell, right? They're holding these signs. And I'm like, you know, like, substance aside, this is really bad da'wah. I've never seen anyone, like, stop there and say, how do I not go to hell? And I used to walk to the student union all the time and I used to see them every single day for years. And I've never seen anyone go, you're right, save me. So who are these guys actually talking to? Right? Were they actually trying to save people from hell? Or did they have some sort of joy and pleasure or a sense of meaning maybe that they derive from being people that tell everybody else they're going to hell? Right? When the Prophet ﷺ stands on Safa, this is not, this is not the, the manner of that discussion. Like, you know me, right? You trust me. I've got your back, and you know I have your back. So just as I have your back in this life, I have your back in the next life as well. Of course, unfortunately... In that moment, Abu Lahab set the tone in a way that was detrimental to the Prophet ﷺ. But that's what he invoked. That's the quality he invoked. And he invoked that quality for a reason. So let's talk about this a little bit. A few narrations in this regard. One of them is a narration from Abu Hurairah anhu. It's narrated in Sunan al nasai It has various uh, forms. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min nisanihi wa yadi. The Prophet ﷺ said, Actually, in this narration, the Muslim is the one from whom the people feel safe from their tongue and from their hand. Salam. They should feel salam from you. So, are you really a Muslim if people don't feel salam from you? You say salam alaikum to your brother and sister, but then you pull out your phone and you give them no type of salam. In the sense that you start to gossip about them, backbite them, you undermine them, you betray them, you hurt them. People are afraid of you. They don't feel safe from your hand and your tongue. They, they don't feel safe from your harm. So how can you be a Muslim 
Of course, the technical meaning of which is La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, following the five pillars of Islam, but how can you be a true Muslim if people don't feel safe from your tongue and from your hand? If people cannot trust you to not go behind their back and to harm them. So when you say Assalamu Alaikum, you're giving your brother and your sister an assurance that there is no harm that's going to come to you from my direction. Peace be on to you. Assalamu Alaikum. So Al Muslim man salim al nas. And this narration the Prophet said, and the mu'min, the mu'min, the believer, is the one from whom people or whom people can trust with their lives and with their wealth, with their lives and with their property. People know that they can trust this person. A true mu'min, a true believer, is someone that people can trust. There's another narration, subhanAllah, from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And especially those of you that are students of knowledge, uh, you, you start to pay attention to, talking especially to the Miftah students, inshallah ta'ala, the seminary students, you start to pay attention to the zawa'ad, these extra words that indicate the frequency by which a Prophet sallallahu says something. It's a narration of Muslim Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said that, مَا خَطَبَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ إِلَّا قَالْ The Prophet ﷺ did not speak to us, sermonize us, except that he would say, لَا إِمَانَ لِمَنْ لَا أَمَانَةَ لَهُ لَا إِمَانَ لِمَنْ لَا أَمَانَةَ لَهُ You do not have iman if you don't have amana. If you can't be trusted, then you don't truly have faith. There is no faith for the one that cannot be trusted. لَا إِمَانَ لِمَنْ لَا أَمَانَةَ لَهُ وَلَا دِينَ And there is no religion. لِمَنْ لَا عَهْدَ لَهُ To the one that cannot be trusted with a covenant or to the one that undermines or betrays covenants and contracts. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَاعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِشَهَادَاتِهِمْ قَائِمُونَ We're a people that take trust really, really seriously. And that's what we learn from our Messenger ﷺ. And if he is the culmination of faith and character, then the most important quality to match faith is can you be trusted? Are you someone who practices integrity? And of course, you know, they say the definition of integrity is that you do the right thing when people aren't watching. For us, it's increased. Ihsan is that you do the right thing because Allah is watching you when no one else is watching you. So you do even more than what's expected of you. Not only do you not undermine, but you beautify, you excel, you go above and beyond even when no one is watching you. And the more that your access to exploitation or abuse uh, grows, the more that amana becomes a more grave matter for you. The deeper the secret, the vulnerability, the less accountability, the higher the position, the more amana becomes serious. And that's why when the Prophet said that of the signs of the Day of Judgment, when amana is lost, when trust is lost, he's talking about leadership. The amana of ilm, the amana of knowledge. That if you're a person of knowledge, you better use your knowledge to bring the people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You better use your knowledge and teach it appropriately and live according to it. You have an amana, you have a trust, you have a position. Amana becomes severe if someone is vulnerable to you and they don't realize it. So you have a secret that someone has given you that is very sensitive, highly sensitive. And you have a moment where you could betray them and share that secret, but you choose not to. Or you could exploit and expose that vulnerability, or that person hurts you. And this is, subhanAllah, one of the greatest, greatest traits of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Not just adul amana, that you, that you uh, fulfill the trust to those that entrust you. Wala takhun man khanak. You don't betray those that betray you. You don't deceive those that deceive you. And I was thinking about this, subhanAllah, about the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I guarantee you that there is a chronological fashion to this as well. You know, if you've had a friend or you've had someone that you said, you know what, I'm not going to go that far with that person, I'm gonna let it go, I'm gonna let it go. But eventually, they keep on getting dirtier and dirtier with you, you say, you know what, forget about it, right? It's time to respond in like manner. I've had enough of this person. If you look at the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the aggression parallels the advancing of his age and of the da'wah. They get more aggressive every single year with him. There isn't a time where they slow down. 
they get worse and worse and worse and worse. And what's amazing is that we often quote this story, this narration, which is a profound and beautiful narration, that the Prophet ﷺ, which is popularized in the books of Sirah, when he made the hijrah, the Messenger ﷺ left Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu behind and entrusted Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu with giving back the people their precious belongings, their precious things. Those that were persecuting the Messenger ﷺ found no one more trustworthy than him with some of their most sensitive belongings. So sometimes I'm like, you know, like if I'm on my way out of Medina, let me take Abu Jahl's watch with me, right? Like, let me, let me take some of these people's stuff with me. They entrusted, forget about entrusting. Like, you people have harmed me in ways that are beyond any type of human parameter of relationship. But still, they find no one more trustworthy than the Prophet ﷺ to hold on to their belongings. We quote this narration, right? How many of you have heard that narration before? Many of you have. That the Prophet ﷺ told Ali radiallahu anhu, stay back and give this person back this, this person back that. And Ali radiallahu anhu is risking his life. The Prophet ﷺ is putting his life at risk as well in order to fulfill that trust that you got to go back and give people this and give people that. It's profound, right? But you know what I was thinking about? Do you know how many secrets the Prophet ﷺ probably had about some of his enemies that he never divulged? I mean, 40 years. Don't you think there was something personal that the Prophet ﷺ could have used against some of those people that were trying to undermine him? He never did. Does the Prophet ﷺ ever get dirty with Abu Jahl? Does he ever get dirty with Abu Lahab, his uncle? I mean, family, you know family secrets, dirty family secrets, right? Does he ever get dirty with his enemies? How many secrets do you think they confided in the Prophet ﷺ with? إِذَا حَدَّثَ الرَّجُلُ حَدِيثًا Hadith Jabir رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ فِي سُنَنِ أَبِي دَوُودِ إِذَا حَدَّثَ الرَّجُلُ حَدِيثًا ثُمَّ الْتَفَتَ فَهِيَ أَمَانَ If someone says something to you and they turn away, that's a trust, that's an amana at that point. If someone sends you something, that's an amana. Don't screenshot it and forward it to someone else if you think that it's going to be bothersome to that person. That's an amana, that's a trust. Someone said something to you. No matter what happens to your relationship after that, in that moment, when they spoke to you that way, when they were confiding in you, that was an amana, that was a trust. The Prophet ﷺ never, never divulges those things. Never. I can't think of a single narration of the Prophet ﷺ getting dirty and personal and scandalizing his enemies. Even though you know he knew some stuff. These were corrupt people. You know he knew some stuff ﷺ, but it wasn't his character. A man of integrity. And subhanAllah, those enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu they, they did not leave a single insult out, right? When they were coming up with the insults. He's a madman, he's a poet, he's a sorcerer. But they couldn't call him dishonest. They couldn't call him a kathab. They could not. There, there, would, there would be no potency whatsoever. Imagine how honest and trustworthy and truthful of a person you have to be that people feel like they'd have a better chance smearing you with madman than liar. Like we would get away with calling him a crazy man before people would believe us in calling him a liar. Because he's too honest. His track record is clean. His track record is spotless. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah kept that track record that way for him. That you will not find anything to delegitimize him with. You'll, come, you'll try, you'll try, but ultimately you will lie and fail in the process. You will not find him to be anything but sadiq, I mean, a man of integrity, a man of trust. Never betrays people, never undermines them, never deceives. وَمَنْ غَشَّ فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا Whoever deceives is not one of us. Scary hadith, by the way. Scary hadith. Whoever deceives is not one of us. Don't consider yourself from amongst us if you're, a deceit, if you're a deceitful person. We don't take deceivers in this ummah. It's so far from the character of the Prophet ﷺ. So despicable to the Messenger ﷺ that anyone who would deceive would come to the masjid saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and pretend to be a noble person. How could you claim nobility if you're a deceitful person? And that cognitive dissonance can develop. 
You know, subhanAllah, I, I spoke about this in, in not this previous khutbah, the khutbah before. I actually spoke about this narration of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum, a very powerful narration about cognitive dissonance, right? And a man comes and he says, you know, yas'aluhu an hukm al ba'uda. He was asking him about dam al ba'uda, about the, the blood of a mosquito. He said, you know, if I, if I uh, kill a mosquito while I'm praying and the blood of that mosquito gets on my clothes, is my salah correct? Ibn Umar radiallahu anhum goes, you people spilled the blood of the grandson of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You killed al Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You murdered a person the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to stop his khutbah for and put in his lap. And his sweet, his sweet grandson sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you're so religious that you're coming and saying, if I get some blood of a mosquito on my garment, does it break my prayer? What? How did this happen? How did you become so disconnected between your faith and your practice? Now, of course, this is an extreme example, murder in a mosquito. I'm talking about what's a more common thing, which is you can't take for granted that a person of deen has khuluq. In fact, as Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah ta'ala said, it is dangerous when a person has deen and not khuluq because that means, that means that they are either hypocrites or that they have misunderstood the religion because what they know of the religion has not rectified their character. And anyone who knows the religion properly will rectify their character. Many of us know people, and may Allah protect us, let's interrogate ourselves first, that are religious, practicing, ritualistic, horrible people though, cannot be trusted will betray, will undermine, will corrupt and be corrupted. I mean, it's like, wait, what? How could you be praying and, and fasting and doing all these things and then be hurting and harming? And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to end this cognitive dissonance, right? Like, this is not the way we approach religion. And how did he do so, sallallahu alayhi minna. If you're selling in the marketplace and you put the, the good wheat and you hide the bad wheat, man minna. That's what he was talking about, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. No, no, let people see what it really is. Don't betray people. Don't deceive people. We don't take that. And it might be that someone would say, well, this is a small thing, but if you allow the small to go unrectified, then the large will eventually follow and dominate. And it becomes a characteristic. It becomes a quality. So are you a trustworthy person? Can people trust you with their secrets? Can people trust you to not take advantage of them and exploit them? Do you excuse deceiving even a person who deceives you? Do you harm those who harm you? Or are you a person of amana, a person of integrity? The Messenger وسلم, was a man of integrity. Integrity. And you know, subhanAllah, he never disappoints, does he? Not in weakness or in strength. Not in political vulnerability or in political power. Not in Badr nor in the Fatih. Not in poverty nor in prosperity. He's the same person, وسلم, like there is no Poor Muhammad and rich Muhammad. You can't distinguish the ahadith about who he is and where he is because the character is the same. And in fact, even the revelation, subhanAllah, as you are going through the revelation, the Quran, the Quran, the character of the Quran being the Prophet and the character of the Quran, when it takes a harsher tone, it does not take a harsher tone because of. The Prophet ﷺ being in a more favorable position to use a harsher tone, rather because the circumstances, which are very clearly tied to it, right, require that type of a tone. But the character of the revelation, the author of the Quran being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the same throughout, and that's very clear. The vehicle, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being a man of stability, a man of character, a man of amana, trustworthiness, truthfulness, that you could always trust, no matter what the circumstance was. And you knew that he wouldn't take advantage of you. You knew he wouldn't wrong you. Like if I was one of those enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, right, and I knew that he had some dirt on me, but I trust him enough that he is so noble that he won't use it against me. Powerful, profound. And so when you see Fatah Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ has these people at his mercy, inside of them, they know that if we were in his situation, this would not be a discussion. This would not be a conversation right now. They had bad intentions with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he's different. He's different. 
Now, with the last few minutes that I have, I want to give you two gatherings because there's something that is very profound about our religions that oftentimes these qualities are so intertwined. Sidq amana, as-sadiq al-amin. Sometimes they're even translated uh, in a way that's interchangeable, trustworthiness and truthfulness, right? Siddiq, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu would not hesitate when he heard the truth to dedicate himself to that truth, right? He, com- he dedicated himself to it as well. Was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as-sadiq al-amin, was he also a siddiq? Of course. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he have any taraddud, any hesitation when the truth came down to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, he exerted himself fully and lovingly and obediently to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was siddiq. As-sadiq, as-sadiq is someone who speaks the truth. And so the ulama say very, very beautifully that as-sadiq fil qawl, to be truthful in speech, means that your words line up with reality, that you are representing reality in the best way with your words. Okay? That your words represent reality. As-sidq fil amal, to be truthful in your deeds, min al mu'minin rijal un sadaqu ma'ahadullah alayhi, that there are those who were truthful to the covenant that they took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be truthful in your deeds means that your deeds match your words. Truthful with your words means that your words match reality. Truthful in your deeds means when you say something, you're going to do it or you're going to intend to do it. You sincerely intend to do it. When you make a promise, you sincerely intend to fulfill that promise. When you say something, you're going to do it. The opposite of hypocrisy. لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you don't do? Instead, O you who believe, اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Be with truthful people. You know, by the way, when you're surrounding yourself with people, and you're thinking about your company. You know, as, as, as one of the, the Salaf says, and I'm, I'm trying to think uh, which one of them. مَنْ نَقَلَ إِلَيْكَ حَدِيثًا فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ يَنْقِلُ إِلَى غَيْرِكَ حَدِيثَكَ Who is that? A Shafi'i? I'm asking you, man. Sheikh Abdullah, you know all this stuff. If I say it in Urdu, Mufti Abdul Rahman will get it. All right? But if someone says something to you about someone else, then know that they speak about you to someone else. So if someone is messy with you about someone else, then know that when they're with someone else, they're messy about you too. Right? So if someone's messy, if someone talks about other people in your presence, then you better know that they talk about you in the presence of other people as well. Right? This is really profound. So, be around truthful people, people of integrity, people of character. And subhanAllah, this narration where the Prophet وسلم, he, he mentions, actually it comes in the form of uh, an advice that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, gives on behalf of the Prophet وسلم, to those that are in leadership. Man nasa bi Whoever pleases Allah and displeases the people. Radiallahu anhu ardan nasa an. Allah will be pleased with that person and Allah will make the people be pleased with them. And whoever displeases Allah by pleasing the people, Allah will be displeased with that person and Allah will make the people displeased with that person. You know what it means when you're a person of integrity? You know, when someone transgresses in your presence, they might find it very annoying if you call them on it. And if you, if you don't indulge it. Like, you know what, let's, let's talk about something else. Like, oh, why'd you have to make this awkward? Like, oh God, you know, this person's not messy enough for me, right? If, if, if people find you to be that way, they, you might be annoying at some times. It's like, and by the way, we don't have to be overtly like astaghfirullah all the time to people. Like there's ways to do this. But in general, if you don't engage the people in some of these things, some of that stuff that's not befitting to the believer, befitting to our character, the backbiting and the gossip and the slander, then initially it's like, you know, they're going to probably be annoyed by you. But if you're a person who's so consistent with your principles, the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will be pleased with you, and Allah will eventually cause the people to be pleased with you as well. They'll respect you. They'll respect you. They might get annoyed with you, a gathering here or there, but at the end of the day, like, you know, that's a, that's a consistent, good, decent person. I trust that person. Who's a better example of that than the Prophet ﷺ? Right? That initially... In Mecca, those same people that objected, they gathered around him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they found him to be a man who was consistent over two decades of persecution, and they all were ready to fight under his banner, to pray behind him, to give their allegiance to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So eventually Allah brought them all around, as-sadiq, al-ameen, al-nabi, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I'm going to give you two gatherings that I want you to think about, okay? 
The first one is one that is very known to you because we're supposed to be followers of this man sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is of course the incident before Islam where they were, you know, competing over who's going to put the black stone. And as they are waiting and they are at each other's throats, the Prophet ﷺ comes in and they say, Al-Ameen radina. Oh, it's Al-Ameen, we're pleased. It's Al-Ameen, we're pleased. Because they knew that the Prophet ﷺ was a trustworthy man. He had our best interests at heart. SubhanAllah, when you look at the death of the Messenger wasallam, and when he passed away, and the chaos in the masjid, when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood up, the people naturally gathered around him. As if they were saying with their actions, as-Siddiq radina. It's the, it, it is as-Siddiq right now. Let's listen attentively because we know who he is and we know that what he's about to say is going to be with profound wisdom and with our best interest at heart. And that is the follower Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we seek to be people who follow in the example of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to bring about sidq, amana, trustworthiness, truthfulness, with word, with deed, then eventually, you know what that will give us in this society? And this is what I want to end with. What it will give us in this society is the moral high ground when we speak. Because we're not compromised. We're consistent having the best interests of people at heart. We have your back in this life and we have your back in the afterlife and we will not sell our deen. We are people who love our deen and we're people who love the people. And we want what's good for them. And if we demonstrate that moral high ground as corruption rises, then that gives us a collective voice in the public sphere when people are searching to say this is the religion of truth and this is the religion of truthful people.